Many people find the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock to be a hard poem to read. And that's understandable. Uh, it certainly can be. Uh, but I have to admit to you that I find it to be a beautiful poem uh, to read. And so I wanted to give you a few guidelines to think about as you look at this poem. And I'm also going to take a few moments to actually read the poem as well. A few guidelines to think about. First of all, as you read this poem, uh, one of the ways to kind of think about it uh, is think about the dramatic moment that is happening here where a man and a woman are going to a party. Uh, at this party, some things are going to happen. Uh, at this party, uh, our speaker, J. Alfred Prufrock, is going to feel really self-conscious. At this party, he's also going to fi find and feel some things that you will find are reflected in the more larger scope of a literary movement called modernism. Now, you'll read more about that in our notes later on, but let me give you this little bit to look for and think about. Modernism believes in something called solipsism. And solipsism is the belief that we are, we as people, are just these small units that are unable to really connect truly and meaningfully with other people. As a result, of course, we may have moments that come close but just don't quite do it. Uh, and I will admit to you, I find just a wonderful heartbreak in that. So one, look for these moments where things almost happen but don't happen in terms of connections between J. Alfred Prufrock and other people, especially one person in his life. Secondly, as you're reading this poem, also take a look at uh, the way T.S. Eliot does a lot of allusions to other types of either historical events or persons, um, or especially a lot of allusions to uh, other forms of writing as well, too. One of the ways in which, of course, you can make uh, anything that you write feel more important, but also be more important, is to connect it to a larger understanding of literature itself. And literature, of course, builds upon itself. So as we read this poem, look for those moments where you recognize uh, references to other things, whether they be people like Michelangelo, um, or whether they be other kinds of references that come out. So I'm going to take just a few moments to read the poem. Now, I'm going to admit something to you uh, that I want you to do, and that is you will see here that there is a there's something that begins the poem that I want you to kind of look up, please, and take a look at. It actually has an interesting meaning and sort of makes the poem work even more. But let me take just a moment to mention the uh, title of the poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. You're going to notice how not loving this song really is. And also I want to note something else, too. J. Alfred Prufrock, not exactly the... Um, most thrilling of all names in the world, very much on purpose for T.S. Eliot to do that. But let's take a moment to take, listen to uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. <clears throat> Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent. To lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once around the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare, and do I dare, time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. 
my morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted with a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, and afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you with a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws, scuttering across the floor of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grow slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it to some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worth while after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, should say, that, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant, Lord, one that will do. To swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool. Deferential, glad to be of use. Politic, cautious and meticulous. Full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. And at times, indeed, almost ridiculous. Almost at times the fool. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottom of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back. When the wind blows the water white and black, we have lingered in the chamber of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown.